Eventually, while developing your game, you'll usually want to bring in a set of external asset files to push it beyond something simple. An asset can be any form of data that you'll use to enhance your game in one way or another. These could include images, sounds, 3D models, JSON data, I think you get the idea. But basically, if it's not included in your code, it'll generally be an asset file. To make these assets accessible to your game code, you'll need a way of fetching, storing and then finally managing them. Luckily as web developers, we somewhat get this power for free by using HTML, as this is exactly what browsers have been designed to do out of the box, fetching the necessary asset files from the server and storing them in the DOM to produce highly interactive experiences. We even get the option to lazy load and stream them these days, all without any extra code. If you've seen any of my previous tutorial videos, you'll know this is usually what I tend to recommend people do for most scenarios, but in some use cases, you might need a little more control over how you manage your assets. For example, loading only the assets you need, and therefore deferring others until later, to save on memory and reduce the initial loading time. This is where an asset manager comes into play, and is generally what most web-based game frameworks tend to offer. This does require a little more effort and thought up front, but some people prefer the flexibility and ease of use they provide once it's available. So why not join me as we create our own asset manager, and explore what's required to make them work within our own JavaScript games? Hi, my name's Anthony, and I like to build stuff for the web using the latest technologies. Before we get into building an asset manager, however, let's first start simple and ensure we're all on the same page by understanding how we load images and sounds dynamically and storing them in code. And yes, for the scope of this video, we'll only be dealing with images and sound files, although to be fair, this is generally the bulk of most people's assets anyway. Turning our attention to the starter project for a moment, I have the usual files to allow us to quickly get up and running. This includes a basic HTML file that contains some simple CSS rules to set up the initial page, along with a canvas element so that we can display our images. We're also using an index file as the entry point and using native ES modules for convenience. In this file, we're using a couple of functions to set up the canvas and animation main loop. Notice we're importing another set of functions from the tutorial code file too. An init function that will set up our project and a main function that will be our main loop. Please pause the video if you wish to copy this code and follow along, I guess. I'm also initially using the logo image and the music track from my starter template, but honestly, any image and sound file will suffice. To be able to reference and use any of these assets in our code or eventual game, we'll have to create an instance of them manually, as we're no longer using the DOM to do this for us. Thankfully, the browser offers a number of element constructors for creating these in code too, using the image and audio objects. Let's start by manually creating an instance of each of these at the top of the tutorial module file. This fundamentally just creates an empty image and audio element. The only difference is that we're holding them in code as variables, rather than in the DOM. The next step is to point these element instances to a source file on our server, so that they fetch and reference that data. We do this by simply setting the source property to the path of the necessary asset file, exactly as you would if you were creating their equivalent DOM elements. And honestly, that's all there is to it. We can now draw the image to the canvas using its context draw image function and play the audio file using its play function. As a side note, I'm clearing the context on each frame using the clear rect function and I've scaled the image four times just for visibility. The result is that we now have the image drawn in the top left hand corner of the browser window and the sound file playing in the background. So you'd expect that we're all well and good at this point. Well, sort of. At the moment, we're just assuming that both of the assets are ready to be used as soon as they've been set up. As we're working locally, the assumption isn't far off, as the load times are pretty much instant. If we were to fetch these assets from a server that had a high latency or a low bandwidth speed, there would most likely be a delay in both the image being displayed and the music being played back. As you can expect, this would definitely ruin our game experience, if players couldn't initially see their sprites, or the sounds never played when they should, as the browser was still fetching the required data. Thankfully, the browser comes to the rescue again, as each of these elements have events that we can hook into to determine if they've successfully completed loading the requested asset file. For images, this is simply the load event, but for audio files, we have two options, either the can play or the can play through event, as shown here. As audio elements have been designed to asynchronously stream audio data from the server, the browser will make assumptions based on the available network bandwidth. The latter event tends to be more thorough in determining if the audio file can be played through to the end without buffering. But generally, I tend to stick with the can play event most of the time. Either way, the event will be fired once it feels it has enough data to play the audio correctly. Let's continue and add an event listener to each of the elements using their necessary events. 
For the sound file, we can simply go ahead and play the music once it's available. However, for the image, due to its asynchronous nature, it would be best to tell the game when it's available before attempting to draw it to the screen. So we'll add a new flag variable and call this image ready, and set it to false by default. Then in the main loop, we'll return early until it's set to true, which we'll do now inside the image's load event. And with that, we're all good again. Unfortunately, we won't see much difference on our local dev environment, but this will be more prevalent when we run from a server or load a larger set of assets. We also gain the advantage of having more control over how we handle our asset files, which fully enough brings us back to the topic of this video, creating an asset manager. And in doing so, we'll look to gradually migrate this code over to one. Let's first create a new module called Asset Loader. Inside this, we'll first create an exporting map object that will hold the potential asset element. The idea is that we'll give each asset an alias key so that we can easily reference it in our game code as necessary. We'll then go ahead and create two new functions that will take care of loading images and sounds. Both of these will take the same parameters, an alias key as mentioned, a file name path to the location of the asset, and an oncomplete callback function, which can be optionally called when each of the files have been successfully added to the assets object. As loading operations are mostly done asynchronously, we'll be using promises for the internals of the asset loader. The topic of promises is quite fast to be fair, so it's probably better suited for its own video, but just to touch on them briefly, promises allow us to run code off the main thread, and therefore separately from the browser's normal execution path. This means its code will run in parallel to your usual code, and its response will be held in a pending state, until it has eventually completed, or rather fulfilled its operation. The result can go in either of two ways, either successfully, the resolved state, or as you can expect, not successfully, the reject state. These are provided as a set of callbacks that allows us to respond back to the original caller. Basically, we're asking the browser to complete a task, and it will promise to return a response at some point later in time. So with this in mind, let's complete the load image function by returning a promise and using its provided resolve and reject callback functions where necessary. You'll notice we're following the same process as before. The only real difference is inside the load event. We're adding the image to the assets map object using the key provided. We can also now call the resolve function to fulfill the promise too, as we know the image has been successfully loaded at this point. I'm also returning an object here with the file name and image data for clarity, although this isn't actually necessary. Lastly, we can also call the oncomplete function here, ensuring it is actually a function before doing so. We'll test this in a moment, but let's complete the load sound function first. We'll copy the contents of the above function and use that as the base, but we'll replace the image element with the audio element, and use the can play event instead. As a quick test to ensure our functions are working as they should, let's jump back to the tutorial file briefly and put them to use. We'll start by removing the element references as we no longer need them, and clear out the init function. Then in its place, we'll make a call to the load image function. We'll use the key of logo, pass on the path location to the image itself, and finally for the incomplete callback, we'll set the image ready flag to true, just as we did before. We'll do the same for the sound file, and use the key of music. And just to show that we can reference the loaded asset, we'll play the loaded sound in the incomplete callback function. Lastly, in the main function, we can use the new imported assets object and get the logo image from it, and store it in the image variable that the draw image function is expecting. And with that, we're once again back where we were previously, with everything working as intended. In fact, we could go one step further and clean this up somewhat. Let's completely remove the image ready flag and the incomplete callbacks from both of the load calls, and instead apply the await keyword in front of them. As we know these functions are promises, this tells the browser to wait until they've been fulfilled before continuing to the next section of code within this function. For this to work, we'll also need to add the async keyword to the function too. With the assets now loaded, we can simply retrieve them from the assets object. For the music sound asset, we can do that in the init function and simply play it. For the logo image asset, in the main function, we can move its get call to the top of the function, which will now return undefined until the image has been successfully loaded. So we can replace the image ready flag check with an image undefined check instead. And there you go, arguably cleaner code. Ok, let's take this to the next level, and rather than loading the assets manually, one by one, Let's add a general load function, allowing the asset manager to do this for us. Back in the asset loader module, we'll define a couple of constant objects to make our life easier. First, an asset type object that defines the assets we support, which we know are currently images and sounds. Then an asset type lookup object that will translate the file extension to the asset type the manager supports. I've included enough for us today, but this list can be extended if necessary. We'll next create a new async function called load, which will take two parameters, an asset array which will contain a list of assets we wish to load, and an incomplete callback function, 
which will be called as each file is successfully loaded. Continuing the theme, we'll now map over the asset array and create a new set of promises. Each asset should have its key alias and a path location, so we'll deconstruct those here for ease. As we're working with file extensions as the identifier, we'll first extract this from the file name using the string substring and last index of functions, and then use it as a comparison with the asset lookup object we created earlier to determine which asset type the file is. Depending on its type, we can then return back the correct load function we created previously. For completeness, we'll also throw an error if we're unable to determine the asset type. Next, we're going to use the promise all function to wait until all the promises we've just created to have been fulfilled, which we know will be a collection of the load image and load sound function results. As we want the load function to have the responsibility of setting up the assets object moving forward, we'll need to change the above functions to accommodate this. Let's first remove the set function calls, and in the resolve callback, we'll change its returned object to have the alias key and the asset itself, which will refer to either of the asset elements we've created in these functions. Again, just for completeness's sake, we'll add another event listener to ensure we capture the error events, and therefore use the promises reject callback. Here we'll return back the file name and its event details. Let's do this in both the load image and load sound functions. With these functions now updated, we can finish up the load function. We'll now iterate over the loaded assets array and deconstruct the key and asset properties from each one. Finally, we can then use these values to add back the asset set function we've just removed, although we now have this in one place. And just before we move on, as we no longer want to provide access to the image and sound functions directly, we'll remove the export keyword from both of these functions to keep them private. And for the purpose of this video, we have our asset manager complete. We can now call the load function and pass on any required assets we wish to load. So let's jump back to the tutorial file and update the code to use this new load function. We'll go ahead and update the load calls so that they use this new function and structure, passing on an array of tuples that contain the key and path value pairs. And there you have it, we're again back to where we were originally, but with the added advantage that we can manually load our assets with one simple load function. I could actually leave it there, but I'd like to put it through its paces and show you how this code would work in an actual complete example. So for the last thing for today, let's do that. We will obviously need a good selection of assets though, in both the graphics and sound departments. So let's source those first. On the image front, I'll be using a freely available asset pack provided by 0x72 on HIO. I'm assuming it's pronounced 0x and not the x value of 114. But this little great asset pack contains a number of sprites themed at dungeon crawlers. The link to this pack will be available in the video description, so why not give them a quick message to say thanks. If we open up the downloaded zip file and navigate to the frames folder, you'll notice all the frames are laid out as individual files. I generally prefer frames to be on a sprite sheet, but that said, this is the main reason I chose this set, as we want a large amount of files to work with, so we can see the most benefit from the asset manager. In regard to a collection of sounds, I just went ahead and downloaded a couple of random sounds from freesound.org. We're just proving our asset manager works as intended, so which ones you download isn't overly important for today's example although I chose the ones listed here if you're interested. And finally for the code, I'll be using my development starter kit as the base, but again this isn't required by any means, it just allows me to jump right into the example code. As for that, let's open up the project I pre-made for this example and walk through what we have. For starters, we have the engine folder from the starter template, which contains all the code to set up the canvas. I've also dropped the image and sound files we've just downloaded into their necessary folders too. In the game folder, the main game class, which is our entry point, references two scenes. The loading scene, which is our initial scene, takes care of the asset loading for our game. And the game scene, which as you can expect, takes care of the actual game while using those assets. We also have an unloaded complete callback, which we pass onto the loading scene that will change the scene to the game scene once the loading has been successfully completed. I've also copied over the asset manager code to its own folder called services and named it asset service in this example. This code is exactly the same as before though. Let's move over to the loading scene now, as this is the main focus of this video. At the top of the file, we have the assets definition. This contains all the files we need to load for the game example. Then inside the scene class, we have a number of functions to handle this. Specifically in the constructor, we're calling a load assets function, which accepts the unloaded complete callback we're passing on. This function calls the asset manager's load function using the asset list above. We're also passing on a callback that logs the file name to the console as each file is successfully completed. I've also added a catch function to ensure we capture all the failed loading attempts. Again, this just logs an error to the console along with the file name details to allow us to inspect what's gone wrong. 
If all goes well, however, we'll finally say so in the console and call the onloaded complete callback, transitioning the active scene to the game scene. As for the updated draw calls, we're currently just displaying the message loading at the bottom right hand corner of the screen and bouncing its alpha to give it a simple animation. But ultimately, you can be as fancy as you like here, such as displaying a loading bar for example. Let's move on to the game scene now. I won't go too much into this class, as its main purpose is just to set up a test scene to prove we can use the assets we've loaded. So in the constructor, we're retrieving the music asset and then playing it. We're also drawing a number of the players and enemies to the screen while animating them with their idle animation. This is all done using the assets object, as you can see here. We also have the standard draw and update functions that take care of all the drawing and animation code. And that's pretty much all there is to it. Let's head over to the browser next and see the results. If we were to refresh the browser, you'll notice we've pretty much taken straight to the game scene. This displays a number of players and enemies facing off in a dungeon environment, all of which have been animated in their idle animation. Notice we also have the music playing in the background. So I think we can safely say that the asset manager, loader or service, whichever you want to call it, is working as expected. Nice. One thing to note though, our loading scene didn't really make an appearance. Well, this goes back to the fact that we're running the code off a local server, and as mentioned, the load times are near instant. So let's look to simulate a server environment, or rather a worse connection through the browser development tools, just so we can confirm the loading scene is doing what we expect. Opening up the network tab, let's first disable the cache so that we can ensure the browser doesn't store any of the previously loaded files. Then in the drop down next to this, choose any of the 3G options. This tells the browser to try and simulate 3G type speeds when attempting to fetch any requested files. Selecting the fast 3G option and refreshing the page again, you can see from the time graph and file list, this slowed down the file requests and we now get to see our loading scene in action, displaying a loading message in the bottom corner of the screen. Let's quickly try the slow 3G option now and compare the difference. The same thing happens, but now the files take a little longer to be fetched, meaning our loading scene stays on the screen for a little longer too. Either way, the game scene is eventually presented when all the assets have loaded. Great stuff. I think we can safely say our asset manager and loading scene are working as intended too. And I think that's where we'll call it for today. I should know that this is just one way of doing this. In fact, we could extend this to cover a whole host of other related data too, as the assets object is just a data store. This could include such things as tile maps, animation sequences, or their frame data, and sound playback settings, amongst other things although I'll leave that for you. Having access to an asset manager can be desirable and is exactly what other game frameworks do. Although as we're now managing the loading of assets ourselves, this comes with the cost of extra complexity and overhead, but we do gain the power of its flexibility. I'll always recommend using the DOM first where possible and leaving this control to the browser, especially if you're developing something simple or with a small amount of static assets. However, this is just another decision I'll leave with you. But let me know which method you prefer in the comments. Either way, if you enjoyed this video or learnt something new, why not give it a like and maybe a share and subscribe? Anyway, thanks for watching and hopefully I'll see you in the next one. Hands out.